I don't want to diminish in any way, shape, or form what the Holy Spirit has already done. But everything that has been said, the songs, the whole venue that the Lord has laid on us lines up exactly what it is that the Lord wants me to bring out. And I'll, amen. I'll try not to keep you for a long time. But I'm going to tell you what, we're not an ordinary church. And I don't say that to be self-serving or egotistical or any of that nonsense. But the fact is, I want God to have His way in this ministry. I want the Lord to bless you and strengthen you and to use you that we might bear much fruit in His kingdom. Pastor Israel, Sister Angie, good to see you guys. Amen. Praise God. All right, well listen. This is the fourth part of the art of war. And I probably won't be able to preach it all. I want you to turn once again to the 144th chapter of the book of Psalms. The 144th chapter of the book of Psalms. You know, that's the largest book in the Bible. And it's all about praise and worship. And I'm going to go ahead and get going because I know it's late. Now, here's what I want to tell you before. Now, nope, I'm not going to preach you in the middle of my message before I get there. <laughs> I'm so excited about this message, man. I tell you what, I'm like a thoroughbred in the stall, man, waiting for the gate to open up. It said, Blessed be the Lord my strength, who teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield, and He in whom I trust, who subdues my people under me. Heavenly Father, once again, as we come before You, we come with our hearts lifted up, a praise in our mouth, Father. You are worthy of all. And I pray once again, Father, as I step aside, I'm praying for the true teacher, the anointing Father to come, that Your people might be blessed and edified and fed, Father, from Your pastures. Oh, hallelujah. God, you know my heart. And you know the hearts of your people, Father, for it cannot be hidden. And I'm asking once again, Lord, that you would anoint them to hear. And Satan, I take authority over you by the shed blood of Jesus Christ and over all the powers of darkness that you will not steal that which is meant for the children. And once again, Father, I ask that Christ and Christ alone be exalted in this house. And I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Once again, this is the fourth part of what I believe God has given me to preach to this church. And if you've not listened to the other parts, get the CDs or get on YouTube or whatever and listen to them. Uh, we are in a war, whether you like it or not. And you can be one of two things. You can either be victorious or be absolutely defeated. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's no reason not to have victory in the kingdom of God because it comes simply through the knowledge and the grace of Jesus Christ. If you know a few simple things, the Lord will give you victory and He will use you in a way that will go beyond your own ability. This is a war dealing with life and death. And I'm talking about eternal and once again, the will and the sovereign power of God's glory has raised up this church. The unadulterated Word of God is the only light and is the only revealed truth given unto man. I said the unadulterated Word of God. There is a word being preached out there that's been adulterated. They're holding righteousness in unrighteousness. They're twisting the Word to get it to go along with what their agenda is. But when this Word is pure and unadulterated, the power of the Holy Spirit will move through it and He will change you. You see, the work of Christ on earth was not tainted. I'm talking about the work that Christ did was not tainted by man's philosophy. Nor was Christ going to be moved from what He was going to do. For His face, as the Word of God said, was like flint. And he would not be detracted, nor would he be distracted from what it is that God called him to do. His journey from the cradle was to the cross. 
and even his best friends, he would not allow them to distract him from where he was going and what he was going to do for us. Because when he came, he died not only for us, but the entire world. Those of us that know him as Savior and as Redeemer, we now are experiencing the incredible joy and peace that can only come from a God that can make of us a new creation where we can have the righteousness of God that dwells on the inside of us. And trust me, Satan don't like it one bit. But you know what Satan can do? I'll leave that up to you. God has founded this church on the bedrock of the revelation of the message of the cross. We're not special. The Berean is simply is not special. But I'm going to tell you, the revelation of the message of the cross, nothing can be highlighted above that revelation. Nothing. And whoever will preach it, whoever will declare it, and whoever will embrace it and have a testimony and live it, I'm going to tell you, God will raise you up so the world can see Christ in you. And that's the only way that He can be glorified in us. Oh, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And again, listen to this. God has founded this church on that bedrock of the message of the cross to be a light to those who will hear. Now listen to me very closely. I didn't say those who would listen. Hear it again. But those will hear who will hear. There are plenty that listen. And agree with the theology of it, but they do not embrace it. Oh, that's right. It gets up here, but it never got here. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't have a testimony, it's not here. It's here. And I've seen people listen, but not hear and walk away in utter defeat. Many of the teachings of Christ offended the listeners. Listen. But it liberated the hearers. Oh, hear what I'm saying now. How can we be any different than the Master? And you know what I'm saying here in a minute. Over the years, I know, and this may surprise you, I have offended some people. (laughs) By pointing out the false doctrines that are birthed by seducing spirits. And I'm sorry if it hurts your feeling, but I'm not sorry for the truth. You know, here's the thing. We will conform or we will break. And the conformity is unto Christ and what He did on Calvary and that and that alone. Paul wrote this in Romans 16, verses 17 through 18. He says, now I beseech you, brethren. When he says beseech you, I'm begging you. Mark them which cause division. And offense is contrary to the doctrine you have learned and avoid them. Paul says, listen, let me tell you something. I am the master builder, not by my own knowledge, intellect, but that which I have received, I received not of men nor by men, but I received it by the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. And that is the foundation that God has given me to build as the master builder. He says, now I caution you. Be careful how you build on that foundation. Any Christian church that is around will not deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They will not deny that He died on Calvary and shed His blood that our sins might be washed away and that He was raised on the third day from the dead. And that He is now on the right hand side of the Father ever interceding for us. And that we can be born again and become a new creation in Christ. Now that's where they stop with that foundation. And now they begin to build something on that foundation that is not of God. And this is why Paul gave this warning. And he says, For they who are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. It's one thing to profess. Confess Jesus, and it's another thing to possess 
Jesus. And there is a distinct difference. He says, but their own belly. Now what that means there, they have their own agenda. And what they want to do is not that of God. Men like myself, let me tell you what. I've played the game of religion for over 55 years trying to follow my Lord. I am not a neophyte when it comes to the knowledge of the Lord. And as I've said before, God prepared me for the message of the cross. He showed me four different times. No matter what men taught that was given to them by seducing spirits would never liberate me. It would never bring me into the grace of Jesus Christ where the Holy Spirit could work in me, where He could be the workmanship of this man. I was the workmanship of men. And I failed and I walked away from the God that I love because I couldn't serve Him. And the Lord takes a four-time loser like me and gives me a testimony. Why do you think I'm so given to identifying that which is false? I don't mean it to be cruel, but I mean it so you can be warned where the wolves in sheep's clothing will not come in and destroy that which God has created by the blood of His only begotten Son. I will not allow it. Oh, I got my teeth in him. And here's how they do it. By good words and fair speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. The simple are those that are naive and do not study the Word of God for themselves. That it might be a witness on the inside of them that what is being preached is true. That's why God said, I want you to call this church the Berean Assembly. Because we're an assembly of men and women that are ready to hear the Word of God and to receive it. And then go back and verify it for yourself. And we just got finished up with five weeks in the new creation class. And I will guarantee you, those people that sat through that class have a better understanding of their salvation now. And they are earmarked to go on with the sanctifying work that God wants to do in their lives. Amen. And He will not be able to steal their salvation from them. Most will not do this. I'm talking about those behind the pulpit. They won't identify these false teachers and preachers. You know, I heard that somebody one time said something about my preaching. Well, why don't he just preach instead of talking about other things that are negative? Well, I am preaching if you listen. If you don't know what's bad, how are you going to know what's good? If you don't know what sin is, how are you going to know what righteousness is? And I want to tell you what sin is. Hold on, I'll, I'll just stop right now and tell you. Sin is not drinking beer. Sin is not cussing. Sin is not running around on your spouse. Now, you may get shot if you do that. Those are products of sin. Sin is a power. And it can only be overcome by that which addressed sin. And that's what Christ did on Calvary. It would be as stupid for me to say Boeing is an airplane. Boeing ain't an airplane. Boeing makes airplanes. That is comparative to the power of sin. And if you try to confront sin by your own ability, I don't know if you've ever eaten cooked goose, but you're going to start smelling like it. Most will not preach against false doctrine. Here's exactly why. They may lose some of the pew warmers that make them rich. It's about money. It's about popularity. It's about not offending people. Let me tell you what, Jesus Christ, every time He turned around, He offended so many people, they tried to kill Him. And He didn't offend the world. He re Oh, let me say this very clear. He offended the religious leaders of that day. And it ain't no different today. Most people want to go to a church where law is preached so they can prove how righteous they are in their walk. So they can point at other people and tell them, well, you're not quite as good as I am. 
And Jesus said this about them. You're a whitened sepulcher full of dead men's bones. There's nothing righteous in you at all. And I'm going to tell you right now, if the righteousness of Jesus Christ is not operating on the inside of you, it is self-righteousness. And nothing will become of that. Let me say, for the 100th time, every time I preach and talk about false doctrines, and this ain't even my message, I am not judging the heart of Joel Osteen. I am not judging the heart of Kenneth Copeland, Paula White, Creflo Dollar, TJ whatever. I'm not judging their hearts. But I'll guarantee you what I will do is I'll judge this junk coming out of their mouth because it doesn't line up with the Word of God. You say, well, why do you tell us? We know the truth. Not everybody in here knows the truth. And some people listen to those platforms and think they're being fed. No, they're not. They're being poisoned by the polluted leaven of the devil. And it is a seducing spirit. What? <laughs> listen. Now, I don't mean to be mean. But if I was out looking for a woman in the bars, and there's this woman at the end that's got four teeth, hadn't combed her hair, I wouldn't exactly go over and offer to buy her a drink. Now, if there's one over there, I mean, she slicked up, dolled up, man, and she looks like a gift out of heaven. I'm going to be over, can I buy you a drink? I said that to say this. Do you think seducing spirits come in and say, hey, what you need to do is to believe blah, blah, blah. No, he doesn't come that way. He comes in a very seducing, seductive way that plays upon your flesh. Now, I'm going to stop and tell you the dream. Then you're going to have to indulge me a minute. I told this dream once before, but the Lord wants me to tell you again. And this is a dream that God gave me. And I know God is my witness when He gives me a dream. He's only given me about five or six, but I know they were from Him. And He gave me this dream. And I, I man, I was upset and I couldn't sleep and I knew there's some things that were goofed up. And the Lord gave me this dream. I walked into this church and it was brilliantly lit. I mean, the light was so bright. And I seen people gather and the place was packed. They were getting ready to worship the Lord. And Sister Cynthia was in this dream. And she says, Pastor, we got a little problem over here in the Sunday school. And I need you to come over here and look at this and address it. And I walked out of there and I walked into the Sunday school. We got it all fixed. And I walked out of the door and I walked into this other room. And it was lit up. And I looked over there and there was this big buffet line. And all of these people were lined up around this buffet line. And as soon as I seen them, somebody turned around and says, Oh, it's the pastor. And then they turned around and ignored me. And they kept going around. And on this buffet line, you could smell this seductive smell of all this mashed potatoes and gravy. And I know you're hungry, so this is going to help. And get your Kleenex and wipe the slobber off your mouth. But they had all these different meats and fried chicken and had all this stuff. And the, the smell was intoxicating. And everybody had their trays out. And they were picking what they wanted, picking and choosing and going through the line. And I, I was wondering, what in the world? And I went outside and I was in the parking lot looking around trying to find out. Somebody could tell me, what is going on? And this one guy says, well, pastor, we have started doing that every Wednesday night. Isn't it funny the Lord say every Wednesday night? Because there's people that could come out here on Wednesday night that don't. Now, I'm not fussing with you. Okay? But I'm telling you, you're lacking that which God wants to give you in addition to what you're receiving. And I said, wow. But he says, we're going to start doing it every night. And then the Lord woke me up. And the Lord began to explain this dream to me. He says, my church is full of people that are living by the dictates of their flesh. They are going through the religious buffet line. And they're picking and choosing what they want to eat. Not what I want to give them, but what they want to eat. 
And the church is full of that today. That's why people say, well, we're looking for a good church. And I heard somebody saying, I might have been Brother Hargrave. Quit looking for a church and start looking for God. You hear what I'm saying? Stop looking for a church and start looking for God. And the Lord showed me that dream to let me know how sick the church really is. As a matter of fact, he tells us in the book of Revelation chapter 3, we find Christ on the outside of the church knocking, trying to get inside the church. Now, I'm commanded to be a watchman, just like Brother Tom was talking about. And I will defend the flock of God with truth. Paul said this in Galatians 1 and 10. He said, am I here to preach the things of God? Or am I here to preach the things of man? For if I please men, I cannot be a servant of God. What you will get out of me is that which is backed by the Word of God. And if there's anything that I preach that's not of the Word of God, as a true brand, if you don't come to me and put me on the carpet and challenge what I said, you're not a good brand. Matter of fact, I had Brother Tom's daughter come up to me after a service one time, and she says, you're wrong. I said, I am. She said, yes, you are. It wasn't Rachel that was the lineage of David. It was Leah. And I said, you know, you're right. I misspoke. Now, that's a true Berean right there. Because she wasn't going to let false, you know, stuff just be said. And I expect you to do the exact same thing. And you won't hear that from pastors behind the pulpit. You go to them and try to correct them. And I tell you what, you may be looking for another church to go to. I'm a fellow servant, even as you. I'm nothing special. We each are a part of the body of Christ, and we have a responsibility. Now, I'm going to tell you something the Lord showed me. And He had me write it down exactly word for word as how He wanted it spoke. Listen to this very closely. The sad thing is some will compromise their relationship with God in order to better their relationship with man. I'm going to say that again because I want you to hear it. The sad thing is some will compromise their relationship with God in order to better their relationship with man. Now let me tell you exactly what I'm talking about. People that choose as churches, they choose it for the wrong reason. And I'm going to tell you right now, if the Holy Spirit didn't bring you to this church and have you to be a part of it, you're in the wrong church. If you go someplace else where the Holy Spirit has not directed you, you're going to find yourself in a lot of trouble. And Brother Jimmy Swaggart said this, and I condone it 100%. The most important decision a Christian will ever make is where they go to church. What are they teaching? What is their doctrine? Most people will go to a church and they go, well, they got a great youth program. Well, they got a Saturday night party. Oh, you know what? On Thursday night, they got movie night. They're at the buffet line, picking and choosing the garbage they want to put into their spirits. Now listen, let me get down to this. Oh man, it's noon. Will you give me just another hour? <laughs> I want everybody to stand up for a minute. I'm going to preach about another 20 minutes. We're a Pentecostal church. I just want you to stand up. Turn around. Do this. Say, wake up. <clears throat> Lord, I got my mind. Wake me up, Lord, that I can hear the rest of what this poor pathetic pastor has got to say. All right, now you can sit down. Because what I do have to say is extremely important. If it wasn't, I wouldn't even keep you. There are some things you must know in the art of war. Number one, you must know your enemy. And I talked about that in the second and third part of this message. You need to listen to it if you haven't. Matter of fact, you need to listen to the original one called Keeping Rank. And I want to add one more thing about knowing your enemy. Your enemy uses one main tool, misinformation. Misinformation. And he uses it all different ways. One of the means that he uses misinformation is to distribute misinformation through a sincere Christian. 
I'll just let that sink in. Because there are those that have been deceived, but they are sincerely deceived. And they'll try to sell that which is not true. Now, you need to know your enemy. The next thing is you need to know yourself. And it's amazing all of the things that were set up here about self. Now listen to this. Perception by the flesh will lead to deception. If you try to perceive the things of the Spirit by your flesh, you will be deceived. And I'll get into it. I want you to turn over to Romans chapter 8. And this is really the crux of my message. And I'll try to get through it. And then I'll let you go and I'll pick it up next week. Now go to Romans. And I want you to go to Romans chapter 8. And I want you to go to verse 1. I'm going to go ahead and start. I'm not going to wait on you. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And that's where most churches will stop. But there's a caveat to it. There's a condition to it where there's no condemnation. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And in the new creation class, we talked about that in depth. And I'm going to get into what I mean by not walking after the flesh, but walking after the Spirit. And not walking after the flesh is not doing, you know, bad things, drinking and all that junk. And walking after the Spirit is not doing spiritual things. Now, here's what he tells us. This is the law that deals with a Christian's walk. He said, for the law of the Spirit of life. I want you to hear that. That's very important to understand that. It is the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now listen, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Understand that if you try to obey God, if you try to live for God by a set of rules or laws, or mandates that a church sets. And I can say this personally. When I was in the church of God, they had their rules. They had their regulations. My first wife, who was a blonde, natural blonde, gorgeous, blue-eyed, from Mississippi. And she spoke with that southern accent, and stole my heart. And then we went to the church of God. And they began to tell us how to live for God. Said the first thing you got. See this is what I hate about these holiness churches. This is what I hate about them. Is those women that think they're so holy. Start gathering around the woman. And say alright now you got to do this. Now honey you got to wear that shirt a little bit longer. You got to wear that blouse a little bit higher. Now honey don't you be cutting your hair now. Now honey. Oh my lord you look like Jezebel. I can't believe. Now, now you know you're saved now. And you got to look saved. Now understand something. If you don't wear makeup. Because God specifically told you not to and you know it doesn't make you righteous, then go ahead, honey. That's fine by me. I don't care. But then my wife tried to comply with the traditions of men. She took her, that stuff where you could see her eyebrows, she took those off. Then she took the stuff off her eyes and took the other stuff in. And I'm going to tell you what, we went to church I thought it was a funeral. She looked dead. Blondes are pale. She was white. She had no eyebrows. Looked like somebody shaved them off in the middle of the night. She had no eyelashes because they were blonde. You couldn't see them. And there were people who said, Honey, are you sick? You feel all right? And because of those laws and and those rules, my wife and I, neither one, could serve God and ended up walking out of that church backslidden because we could not comply and live by the laws that they had established. Now, let me tell you something. This is what the Bible says. 
for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. You see, the true spiritual women in the church of God at that time, they looked like they were just been washed out. I mean, they, I mean, man, you know, I heard Brother Jimmy one time say, man, put some paint on that barn. <laughs> you know, this is not my second wife, and I've said this before. This is my last wife. We've been married over 35 years. And I'm going to tell you what. Amen. My wife will spend a half hour in the bathroom to look pretty for me. And I thank God. Amen. I go in there, I spend about the same time to try to be pretty for her. My hair, get it all done up. You know, I know the wind's blowing. I got my 40-mile-an-hour hairspray on here. Man, I got out in the wind, and it was like a helmet. It just... <laughs> but God doesn't expect us to look ugly just to be holy. My Lord! And you know, Sister Barb, I call her Sister Bling Bling. Man, she puts the jewelry stuff on. She looks sharp with that stuff on, man. She doesn't wear it. So she can show off and say, hey, look what I got. You know, they say, well, if you wear makeup, you'll be like Jezebel. No, you won't be. Because when Jezebel took her makeup off, she still had the heart of Jezebel. You take the makeup off somebody that has the heart of Jezebel, and they'll still be Jezebel. But this is my point, right? Man, i got to get on here. He said... God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. What He did, He showed Satan, bring it on. I'm here representing man. Now do your best. And He condemned sin in the flesh because it never had any part in Him. And when it didn't, He was the qualified Lamb of God that, oh hallelujah, and went to the cross of Calvary that we might be made free not by what we do, not what we don't do, but by what He has done on the inside of us. We're His workmanship, not you. My Lord, I hope that's clear. Now listen to this. He said, why? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Listen, here it comes again. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I'm, gonna get, I'm glad you asked what that is. I'm getting ready to tell you. He says, for they who are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They're in the buffet line. Well, this church doesn't believe in wearing makeup. I'm going to the next church. Well, this church right here says it's okay to drink wine. I'm home. Oh, this church here has the biggest Sunday school outfit I've ever seen. I got buses that bring people in and feed them hot dogs. This is my church. Oh, yeah. I get rid of my kids, and then I can go in here, and they leave me alone. Oh, I know where I'm going to church. Man, there's 5,000 people in this church. They'll never find me. This is my church. So they're going to appease their own religious conscience. They do the things according to the flesh. But they who are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now listen to this very closely. For to be carnally minded is death. That carnally minded means to be after the flesh. That's what it's talking about. To be carnally minded is death. What do you mean? Carnal Christians are everywhere, but they're not dead. Remember what I said? For the Spirit of life. Paul in Romans 7, 9 said, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, when my flesh decided to serve God and by what I do and the things that I don't do trying to obey the commandment, he says, I sin revived and I died. That's why he said to be carnally minded is death. And not only that, it gets worse. Give me about another 10 minutes and I'll let you go. Don't get restless on me. If you look nervous, you'll make me nervous. You need this. Listen to it now. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal 
mind is enmity against God. It's at war with God. It's hostile against God. It will not allow God to do a work in your life. And it denies the work that Christ did on Calvary. Mm, all right. What do you mean to be carnal minded? It means to be of human origin, human empowerment. Spiritual decisions are done apart from faith. Hear it very closely. Independent from God's inner working. God has nothing to do with it. This is unaided human effort that proceeds from that which is self-empowered. That's what he's talking about here. And it says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And that's in verse 8 of Romans 8. I'm going to read one more scripture to you and then I'm going to let you go. Because I can sense a little unrest. Listen to this. Oh, I don't want to say this. I don't want the carnal Christians in here getting uneasy and nervous now. <laughs> I'm not going to say everybody's spiritual, raise your hands, because that wouldn't be right. All right. Because some of you lie. <laughs> now listen to the first verse that I read. Listen. It says here, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That condemnation comes from yourself. Because you are continuously walking in defeat. There is no way to have victory. My question is this. To every church out there that does not understand this message of the cross, I would ask them. Are the people in your church defeated by sin? The answer has to be irrevocably yes. Because if they are getting victory over sin without the message of the cross, then the message of the cross is a fraud. But I know it's not a fraud because I have a testimony. They can lie about being defeated by sin, but I know they are. Now, what they may define as sin is different than what God defines as sin. They are being defeated by it. Now, when I talk about the flesh, and I told you guys last week, some people say, well, you've got to die to self. That is not Scripture. There's no such scripture as dying to self. It's called deny yourself. That's what Christ said. And take up your cross and follow me daily. Take it up daily. Now, here's what I want to say about the flesh. Here in Galatians 5.24, it says, They who are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. What that's talking about there, my desire to be looked at as something spiritual. That's the lust of your flesh. The affection of people looking at you and say, oh, you're such a great Christian. Oh, look at her. Her hair is, you know, <laughs> Sister Michelle, boy, you make a good Pentecostal girl. You take that makeup off. That hair is down here, man. I'm telling you. But see, we crucify the flesh. That means our effort that is self-empowered to try to live for God. Now think about this. Man, this, this, is, this is the revelation of the message of the cross. If you are confronting sin, you're in the flesh. Hear what I'm saying? If you are trying to confront sin head on, oh, I can't do that. I, I got to quit. I got to quit. The Holy Spirit will not work in your life. That was the perfect peace that I came into when I finally found out what it means to be setting with Christ in heavenly places. Christ is at rest. His work is done. His work is done. It's complete. And if I'm trying to confront sin head on, I was constantly defeated. All that was on my mind, well, I shouldn't do this, and I've got to do this, and, I, you know, I can't look at porn. Oh, and, and I stop, I repent, I cry, and, and then I got that porn side on my favorites. So I don't have to look for it again. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. 
And as I tried to confront sin head on, I was carnally minded. I was being hostile to the work that Christ did on Calvary. If you've got a problem with sin, quit trying to confront sin. What you've got to do is walk in the Spirit. You have got to crucify the flesh with its lust and its affections to overcome sin in your own power and ability. Because you are hostile. You are at war with God. God says, I've got it all done on Calvary by Jesus Christ. If you will believe, you see, that's walking in the Spirit. That's walking in the Spirit. And that is hard for man to do. Because they want to be a part of what God is doing to sanctify them. And I got news for you, you can't do it. All that will happen is you'll be at war with God. You will fight against the very thing that His Son gave His life for. And that was to not only save us, but to continue to save us and to sanctify us to His glory. And here's what the last verse is I'm going to read, and I'm going to let you go. He says in verse 25, If we live in the Spirit, that talks about you have gained your life through what Christ did on Calvary, and you're born again. Now, you are living in the Spirit. You see, that life that you have, that new creation that you are, didn't come from your efforts. It didn't do because you were the best Boy Scout on the block. You didn't obtain righteousness in your own efforts. The way you got it was through Jesus Christ dying on Calvary, and you believing in that. That's the only way you could be born again. There is no other way. He says, if you're going to live in the Spirit, hey, I got it. Paul says, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, say, hey, I got an idea for you. Why don't you walk in the Spirit? And Colossians 2, 6 says this, as you have received Christ Jesus, so walk ye therein. Walk in Him. And the simplicity behind this message is faith and grace. And the object of your faith is Christ and what He did on Calvary. If you walk in the flesh, you are fighting against the God who is the author and finisher of your faith. Stand to your feet. Amen. I had much, much more, but I could tell that we're done. <laughs> Listen, my heart's desire is each and every one understands this message of the cross to such a depth in their heart that nothing will ever move you. False doctrine will not have a chance when you understand the message of the cross. No matter what man brings to you or says, you will never fall for it. You'll never fall for that seducing spirit that wants to bring into you this leaven which will destroy that which Christ has given to you. Heavenly Father, thank you again. You're such an awesome God, Lord. And Lord, we offer up again a thanks and a praise to you. For Lord, without you, Nothing can be done. But Lord, in you we are complete. And once again, Father, I pray that you strengthen your people. Keep them, Father. And again, bring them back at the appointed time. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Love one another.